only going to consider SEMA-honest adversaries, for those who are familiar with uh, secure multi-party protocols. And we have efficient protocol uh, implementations of all the protocols I'll describe here. So when we think about the, this problem, most people, when they hear it for the first time, uh, come with this uh, naive solution. They say, OK, Alice has inputs x1 up to xn. Bob has his own inputs. A possible solution is for both of them to agree on a hash function, a cryptographic hash function, which is easy to compute and hard to invert. And then Alice will send to Bob, or Bob will send to Alice the hash values of each of his items. Alice will compute the hash of her items and compare them and find the intersection. And this seems secure because this hash function is one way. So if you see age of y, you don't know, you cannot reverse the computation. So this seems secure and it's very efficient. The problem with this approach is that the items might come from a relatively small domain. So if we consider, for instance, that the items are IP addresses. So there are only two to the 32 options for each value. So what Alice can do when she rece receives these values, she can just compute the hash of each, of each possible uh, IP address. This will take her probably less than a second. Uh, and then she just compare them to the values that Bob said, and she'll know a Bob set. So this solution is nice, but it doesn't protect, uh, protect privacy if the items don't come from a, a universe with high entropy. And it's interesting because some companies actually use this, this solution because it gives you some kind of a nice fuzzy feeling that this is, uh, this is secure. So PSI has many applications. Uh, it can be used for information sharing between different companies that want to see if say, they, they were attacked by the same, you know, same threat. Uh, matching things, matching DNA, or you can think of a dating application when you want to match preferences of, of two persons. Uh, people talked about it using for uh, all kinds of app to identify mutual contacts of phones of different people, and then uh, if identify, you know, uh, mutual contacts between a new subscriber to the application and old subscriber, I can target that person or give him content that uh, I know that the, his contacts like. And another very appealing application is computing ad conversion rates, and I'll go into it in more detail. So think about online advertising like Google or uh, Facebook is doing. And then uh, retailers show ad and something which is very useful that these companies are doing is they tell the advertisers how useful the ad was, okay? So when you put an ad in the newspaper, you don't know how useful it was. If, if you put it on Google, then it can tell you how many people click on the ad. And they call it the ad conversion rate. Uh, ideally, it should tell you for each ad, you know, how much money you made out of it, how much money was, you know, converted to actual, uh, how much, ads were converted to actual transactions. This is very important. This is you know, how these companies are making money. It's worth billions. So it's easy for online web shops, but it's very hard with offline uh, 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 purchases. So suppose that Alice, you know, she sees an ad for some uh, painting uh, equipment on her machine, and then the next word she goes to this company and she buys, buys this thing. So Google or Facebook, would like to somehow tell the advertiser that this purchase was done was done because Alice uh, saw this ad, okay? But they don't know that she went to that you know store later. They, they don't know how much she bought there, okay? Uh, so basically, you have to take the database of the uh, real world shop and compute the intersection of that database with those who have seen ads. For that, you know, for that store, and based on that, compute how useful the ad was. So this seems kind of, you know, you know, maybe uh, 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 science fiction, but this is what these companies are doing all the time. This is how they make money because then they can go to the advertisers, advertisers, and tell them like, look, you made so much money because of this ad. Then you have to pay us this and that. And this is, of course, much more complicated than what I'm saying, but you have to combine two private databases. Okay. Uh, and actually, both of these companies, both Facebook and Google, are using variants of uh, private setting section to do exactly this thing, according to uh, publications in the press and in some uh, presentations that they made. Are they factoring also the time 
they factoring time, they factoring things like, uh, you know, the, 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 ad, the ad is targeted to, you know, 30 year olds who make this amount of money and, uh, you know, live here or there. So they show the ad to say 95% of that population. Then they count how many people from the control group, the 5% bought the item because they're likely to buy the item anyway. They count how many people from the 95% group bought the item and the difference, they, you know, they can quantify it, how much revenue was generated by the ad. I mean, this is how they make money. I'm sure that more people are working on, than, on it than those working on uh, search quality. Okay, that's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so PSI is important and there have been lots of work on PSI. So there are some solutions which I say, okay, they're based on Diffie Hellman assumptions. Those who are not in crypto uh, probably don't know what I'm talking about, but you shouldn't worry too much. I'll explain everything that is needed. So I knew about this work from 99 by Huberman and Franklin, but then I was referred to earlier work, and apparently Catherine Meadows did something similar in 86, and Adi Shamir has something similar in a paper from 1980. Uh, there's another work on, which uses public key encryption to do PSI by uh, Emiliano and Gene Sudik, and they use uh, blinded RSA in some versions of it. There is work based on generic secure multi-party computation and circuits. This is the focus of our talk, and I'll, I'll talk more about it. There's work based on bloom filters, and there's also work based on oblivious transfer and hashing. I'll describe it in, 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 in short. Those who don't know this was Diffie, Hellman, RSA, MPC, bloom filters, and oblivious transfer, don't worry, you, I'll tell you everything you need to know. And the main issue is that comparing two sets requires, in general, n-square comparisons. And doing n-square is, is too complicated. And th these items come from a big universe, so you, you cannot do any tricks. And we want to reduce the number of comparisons. OK. So the most recent, the most efficient constructions are based this started with work of me with uh, Thomas Schneider and his student Michael Zoner and continued afterwards. Basically, we realized that computing PSI in some sense can be very efficiently done using oblivious transfer, which I won't describe. And oblivious transfer can be computed with oblivious transfer extension, which is very fast. And therefore, we just have to push everything to do to oblivious transfer and use hashing to make this, to reduce you know, how many we have to compare with how many, and then we do it very efficiently. So how efficiently? This is a slide that shows how the different approaches work. So this is runtime, this is communication. These are logarithmic uh, uh, scales, so from here to here you go by a factor of 10. And you want to be here, you know, minimal runtime, minimal communication. These are the, Diffie the public key based approaches, the RSA and Diffie-Hellman, okay? They have relatively very good uh, communication. The runtime is pretty high, uh, and this is Diffie-Hellman with elliptic curves, which uses smaller modulo size, so the communication is better. These are the circuit-based approaches, which are our focus. I'll talk more about them. They have high communication and high runtime. This is the most recent oblivious transfer-based approaches. They have very good runtime and good communication, and actually, they're only six times slower than using this hash function in the uh, you know, naive solution, which is insecure. So it's, it's, it's pretty good. Our goal is to take these generic you know, circuit-based constructions and try to move them here. We'll just move them by a little bit. OK, but this is the goal. And I'll tell you why, why that's important. OK. So PSI is a specific example of secure two-party computation. Secure two-party computation is the problem where you have two parties with private inputs, and they want to compute some function of the inputs without revealing, revealing anything else about the inputs. So in our case, they want to compute the, uh, uh, the intersection. They could do other things, say, compute some you know, statistical you know, test of the inputs or you know, whatever, okay? Uh, and MPC is the, you know, generic name for doing these secure multi-party computations. So luckily, there are generic protocols for securely computing any function, 
Okay? In particular, they can be used to computing set intersection. Okay? Uh, so the question is, you know, why am I focusing on set intersection where there are very good generic solutions that can apply, be applied anywhere? And the issue is that these generic solutions, uh, they require you to have the function represented as a binary circuit using end and not gates that you probably learned in your first year at, at, the, at the university. Okay? So if you want to compute a function, you have to describe it as a binary circuit, and then there are generic protocols and software packages that you can use. Okay? So basically, you have to take the set intersection problem and represent it as a, uh, as a circuit. Now, there are good reasons to use a generic solution. Uh, one of them is that adapt adaptability. So consider that you designed a very good solution for computing the set intersection, and then your boss or a customer or a colleague comes and says, okay, I'm not interested in computing the intersection. I want to know how many items are intersection, uh, but not, not the intersection itself. So then you have to work hard or hire a compute, com you know, crypt crypto expert to do it for you. And then they come and say, we don't want to compute the size of the intersection, but rather a bit, which is one if the intersection is greater than 100 and zero otherwise. So again, you have to hire a crypto expert to do it for you. Now, suppose you had a circuit which computes the intersection, okay? Then if someone comes to you and says, okay, says, okay I want to compute the size of the intersection, so basically you should get a, you know, a second year undergrad who learned about uh, 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 Boolean circuits and ask him to design a circuit which counts you know, how many items are in the intersection. And then if you want to output a bit, depending on whether the number is greater than 100 or not, then he should compare the result to 100 and then output the bit. So basically, instead of having to design a new protocol for each variant of the problem, you basically have, basically have a programming language, the you know, circuits, which, which you can compute you know, any version of the problem. Another reason for using these generic approaches with circuits is that we have very good implementations that do this secure two-party computation, and they run extremely fast. So once we have a circuit, we can use them. And also the existing examples, for instance, computing the ad revenues, they don't compute the intersection it's itself, but rather you know, they have revenue for each transaction. They find which one transactions are at the intersection, then they sum them up. Okay. So this is something that can be naturally done with a circuit, and it's harder to design a specific protocol for that. By the way, you can ask questions, of course, throughout the talk. So we'd like to design a circuit-based protocol, and there are generic protocols for computing any function with a circuit. There's the GMW protocol, the R protocol. I won't go into details, okay? But a lot of work has been done on implementing them very efficiently. And we are sure that the parties don't learn anything except for the desired output. And the overhead only depends on the size of, of the circuit. The problem is that a naive circuit for doing PSI has to compare each item of the first set with each item of the second set. So it's going to be doing n-square comparisons. And this might be too much. Okay, if n is a million, this is too much. And n is a million. So can we do better? So if we look, so just comparing two specific values, the values say that S bits, then comparing two values is very efficient. Basically, you have to XOR each bit, I mean the ith bit of X with the ith bit of Y. The result is zero if they're the same, and then you should compute the no of this. And with MPC, actually XORs you're doing for free, so you have to do Basically, S minus one gates for doing that. So comparing two 32-bit numbers can be done using, you know, essentially 31 gates, and we can process millions of gates per second, even more than that. So that's that's great. So comparing two items is efficient. The goal is to arrange the two sets of items so that we have to do as few comparisons as possible. So this is actually not new. And the first solutions were based on uh, sorting networks. So sorting networks is you know, something old from the 60s, I guess, if not earlier. And they were used to actually sort phone conversations where you had like, you know, copper wires and actual, you know, sorting machinery, okay? So a sorting network is a network of wires and small comparator modules 
which get two inputs and I compares them and then either and outputs them in, in the sorted order. Okay? And there was a lot of work, I guess, in the 60s on making them as efficient as possible because this is how phone networks were built at the time. So we can do PSI based on these protocols. So sorted networks were designed for actual you know, networks, but we can design a binary circuit based on them and using this circuit compute PSI. Like everything will be done virtually in, in the computer, but this will be you know, based on that work. So suppose you have two lists of Alice and Bob. Each list contains uh, uh, values, and we know that no list, no li the list don't, a single list doesn't, all the values in a single list are different. So there are no two uh, uh, identical values in the same list. The first thing they would like to do is to merge the two lists to have one long sorted list of the union, okay? So this was done in 68 by Batcher, and this is a network which gets two lists of size n. Each thing here is a comparison which takes this value and the other value and compares them and outputs them in sorted order. And using exactly n log 2n comparisons, you can uh, get the uh, sorted uh, list. Basically, merge to a sorted list. So the whole circuit works like that. Each party sorts its lists, its list. They insert the list to a, a bitonic merging network, the one I've seen before, which output a sorted union of the two lists. Now, if Alice and Bob had the same item, then in the sorted union, the two copies of that item would be adjacent to each other. So now, now all we have to do is go through the list, compare to each two adjacent items, and see if they're equal or not. This can be done using just two N equality checks. Then at the end, they want to uh, shuffle the results because we don't want to show that there was a match, say, in the first two items that, that are compared because this reveals something, the order where the matches are occur reveals something to Alice about Bob's uh, uh, list and vice versa. So we have to shuffle the result. This is also with n log n. So everything can be done with three n log n plus four n comparisons. And each comparison takes s, s gates. So this is pretty good. This was done by Huang, uh, Evans, and Katz. Another version of a circuit was done by uh, me with Thomas Schneider, Gil Segev, and, 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 and Mike Zoner, and it works dif uh, in a different way. So, okay. One party maps, maps its items to about two end bins using cuckoo hashing, and I'll describe cuckoo hashing a bit later. So, and it ensures that each bin, so we have about two end bins, and each bin will contain a single item. If you don't know cuckoo hashing, you'll understand shortly why it works. The RT party maps its item to these bins using simple hashing. You'll have this number of items in each bin. Then basically you have to compare each bin of this party to each bin of that party. So you have to compare, you know, n times, we have n bins, one item to log n over log log n uh, 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 items. So the total number of comparisons is n times log n over log log n. It's better than the n log n that was before but we want to reduce it to just O of N. So the challenge here is to find the smallest circuit for computing PSI. Uh, both parties can prepare their inputs, but the circuit must not depend on the data. It should be the same circuit no matter what the da data is, is. And then once we have the circuit, we can compute any function we want of the intersection afterwards. So for instance, count how many items are in the intersection or whether the number of items is greater than some threshold. Or if we care about privacy, we can add some noise to the count to ensure differential privacy. Or we can sum values associated with transactions or whatever. And the goal is to minimize the number of comparisons in the circuits and also the, the length of the items. So what I'm gonna show here is a circuit with a linear number of comparisons uh, there's one construction which, uh, which has a provable linear overhead, and another construction which has a linear overhead which was experimentally verified, and we don't know yet how to prove it, but the constants here are much smaller. 
uh, we run an implementation experiments, and the runtime is better than that of the O n log n over log log n uh, construction. I write here surprisingly because Udi Vida, who's a co-author, he works a lot on algorithms, and he said that it's, uh, it's, it's usually when you have an algorithm like that, the, and there are improvements which Im improve the algorithm to run in linear time, it's better asymptotically, but practically these algorithms run better. Like even if n is a million, log n is 20, log log n is five, this is four, okay? So, but uh, surprisingly, we get an algorithm which run, runs faster. And on the road, we also have a new analysis for cuckoo hashing, both for the old, to the known version of cuckoo hashing and to new variants of it. Okay. So I'm talking a lot about hashing. Let's talk about it in, in more detail. So the basic observation with which I hinted already is that, you know, if, if both parties agree on a hash function, which is independent of the inputs, then the parties can each map the inputs to bins. Say, if they have inputs, they can map them to n bins, okay? And then the nice property is, but is, is that if both Alice and Bob have the same value, same input x, they're both gonna map it to the same bin. So they map x to the bin age of x. The, the range of uh, this hash function is one to n, the bins, okay? So they're both gonna, if they have the same input, it's gonna be mapped to the same bin by both of them. So now, instead of comparing all of Alice items to all of Bob items, we just have to ma compare the items that Alice put in that bin to the bo items that Bob put in that bin, okay? Much smaller. So if we have n items which are mapped to n bins, how many items do we expect to find in each bin? A constant number of items. So in expectation, we'll have you know, one item here, one item here. Comparing them is, you know, uh, square the number of items, but it's also going to be linear, uh, I mean, constant. So overall, we're going to have a linear, uh, linear overhead, okay? N times constant overhead. This looks great. The only problem is, or the major problem, is that if we throw N items to N bins, some bins are going to have more items than others. And the parties need to hide from each other how many items they place in each bin because the hash function is public. Because if, for instance, Bob knows that Alice didn't place any item in the first bin, and he knows that a certain, you know, a certain value, the hash of um, that value would have been placed in the first bin, then he knows that Alice doesn't have that value. And this might leak information. So we need to hide how many items then that we map to each bin. Okay. And the only no way I know to solve this is to pad each bin with dummy items so that all bins will have the same, I mean, the same number of items of them. So some bins are quite empty, others are full, but we have to map, um, pad each one of them to be as full as the uh, largest bin. And when we map n items to n bins, the expected side of a bin size is constant, but with high probability, the most occupied bin will have log n over log log n items, so we have to pad each bin to be of that size. So then the circuit will be, you know, n times comparing log n over log log n to log n over log log n. So this could be log n squared over something, or we can do a sorting net network for that. But that's 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 not linear overhead. Okay? And we want to do we want to do better. So here is where cuckoo hashing comes to help us. Cuckoo hashing is, is a very useful tool which was designed by uh, uh, Rasmus Pau and Rodler in, in 2001. And the version I talk here is, I talk about here is by Kiel Schmitz and Macher and Vida. And the idea is the following. Instead of just you know, throwing n items to n beans to a table of size n, in which case a bean might have many items, I have two tables, each one of them is of size n, and also a stash, which will be very small, like two or three items. And I have a hash function associated with each item, with each table, either this h1 for t1 and h2 for t2. And a value x could be either in location h1 in table one, or location uh, h1 of x in t1, or h2 of x in t2, 
or it could be placed in this small bin of size two or three, okay? And then when you look in for an item, you know that it's either here or here or here. So you can look for an item with a constant number of, of, of lookups. So that's very useful. This is essentially a dictionary where each item can be uh, found with a constant number of lookups. And there are, you know, there's a very efficient algorithm for inserting items too. Cuckoo hashing, I won't describe it here. And the nice property is that the size of the table is, is slightly more than linear, then it's possible to store n items in this table, except with probability which is n minus the size of the stash plus one. So if the stash is of size two, except with quadratically small prob probability, uh, uh, Cubic, cubically small probability, you won't be able, I mean, you'll be able to store n items here. Uh, so this is ex extremely useful. Uh, you see that we lose a little bit. We have to store n items, and the size of the table is about, this is of size n, this is of size n, so the size is 2n, so we only use like 50% of the memory, but it's, ex it's, it's an extremely useful tool. By the way, who here, who has heard of cuckoo hashing in the audience? Okay, it's, it's extremely useful. You know, I think they should be teaching it in undergrad algorithms course. It's, 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 it's really good just as, as, as a tool. Okay. Now, there is some probability with which we you know, have a set of n items and we won't be able to place them here, here, or here. Okay? And the probability is n minus s plus one. So, what happens if we use uh, cuckoo hashing for any security-related approach, okay. application? Then it might happen that we won't be able to map the items to the tables. Just, you know, it, it, the hash functions just I mean, happen to be, you know, no, won't work well with the inputs. The probability is this small, but this might be, might cause uh, either an accuracy problem or a privacy breach. If we cannot put an item in the tables, then the result would, would, wouldn't be uh, 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 accurate. And if I'm not able to map my items to the tables and I'm telling the other party, look, we should choose other functions, this leaks some information about my inputs to the other party, okay? So when this happens, that's bad. That's, a, that's some you know, failure of the protocol. And we would like to limit this probability. So in cryptographic applications, usually we set some st statistical security parameter, and we want the failure probability to be smaller than that. Usually we want to make it smaller than two to the minus 40, okay? This is the probability of just things you know, not working well. Since we know that this is n minus s plus one, we know that for any uh, stash size s, from some value of n, okay, uh, the probability will be smaller than, than, than 2 to the minus 40. So basically, if, uh, if n is greater than some threshold n, then if the stash is bigger than that, then we should be fine. So this is good, but there is one issue. The guys who did this algorithmic analysis, uh, they only cared about asymptotic, so the theorem we have just claims that the failure probability is big O of n minus s plus one, whereas in cryptography, we really want to get like, you know, a specific, like, you know, a, a, a concrete numbers. So this is, this, that's not good enough. It's good asymptotically, but we want to know about actual numbers that we're using. And this is actually uh, uh, quite a challenge here. And if you look at the proofs, it's, it's quite impossible to get from the proof what are the actual numbers because they depend on other proofs which are asymptotic and it's, you know, it's impossible. It's possible, but it's, you know, it's very complicated. Okay, so can cuckoo hashing uh, help us? So, okay, the problem was that we had to pad the beans to have about log n items, okay? So if Alice and Bob use cuckoo hashing, that's great because Alice maps her items to these two tables, so it's going to only we'll have one item in each bin, and Bob will have one item in each bin. So we can compare two bins with just you know, one, one comparison. The problem is that Alice might decide to put X in table T2, and Bob might decide to put X in table one, 
So therefore, they won't compare the same. I mean, they won't be able to compare it. Okay. So the, the I mean, the issue with cook. I mean, the cook hashing is so efficient because each item can be placed in two locations. But this is also why we cannot use it as it is. And previously, it was solved in the following way. Alice, uh, OK, Bob uses cuckoo hashing. So its item is placed, uh, placed either here or here in, this, or in the stash. So Bob uses, you puts only a single item in each bin. Alice uses uh, simple hashing. So basically, she maps all her items to T1 using the first hash function, and all her items to T2 using the second hash function. Okay, so she's going to get uh, a log n over log log n items in each bin. Then we know that if Bob happened to put x here, Alice puts x both here and here. So regardless of where Bob decides to put it, he'll be able to compare it with what you know with uh, 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 with Alice's data structure. Okay. So how many comparisons we have? We have order of n bins. For each one, we have to compare one item with log n over log log n. So the total number of comparisons is this. Also, for each item that Bob placed in the stash, which is of constant size, we have to, do, have to compare it to each item of Alice. So this is the total number of comparisons. And we can use something called uh, permutation-based hashing to uh, store only short values. So, from this, you can get a circuit. How will the circuit work? Okay. Uh, Bob uses cuckoo hashing to map his items to bins. Okay. Alice uses simple hashing. For each bin, we have log n over log log n items of Alice, one item, one item of Bob. The circuit should take each of these log n over log log n items and compare it with the item of Bob. The total number of comparisons is n log n over log log n plus uh, n comparisons for for each of the items in the stash. So this is a circuit instruction. Okay? The size is n log n over log log n. Uh, and that was the best that was known before. Okay. So this is what we've done. So I'll start with the asymptotic construction. And we use something which we call mirror hashing. So we have four tables, uh, each one of size a bit more than n. And we actually have, OK, two sets of four tables, four here and four here. And we have only four hash functions. A color here is a hash function. So we have the uh, blue, red, uh, purple, and yellow hash functions. And you see that they are reused between the tables. OK? So we use the same set of hash, of, of, uh, hash functions, both in the left set and the right set, but in different order. OK. So what Bob is doing, he uses cuckoo hashing to put each item of his in uh, one of the two tables in each column. So if you look at one column, OK, you have here two tables with two hash functions. You can use cuckoo hashing to place each item either here or here. And let's, let's forget about the stash, OK? Similar here, each, he puts all of his set either in this table or that table. Similar here, he puts each item either here or here, and so on. So he ends up putting. Uh, each of his item in you know, one location in each column. This is what Bob is doing using simple cuckoo hashing. Now Alice uh, starts with a set of the left four hash function, and she uses cuckoo hashing to put each of her items either here or here, and then either here or here, just like Bob, but just on one set. Then look at the specific item of Alice. It might happen that the cuckoo hashing algorithm chose to insert this item to the left table on the first pair of tables and to the left one on the second pair of tables. So basically, it chose to put both of them on the same column. Because the algorithm puts either, you know, either here or here. So it might happen for some items that were put, uh, they were both put in the same column. That's a good property. And these items will keep here. Other items. The algorithm might have chosen to put in the left column here and in the right column here. Okay? But then Alice will store these items, which are not put in the, same col in the same column here. She'll store them in the right set of tables using the same table, the same 
hash functions, but look, in the right set of tables, we use the same hash functions, but we kind of reverse or mirror the order of the lower two hash functions. So if two items were mapped in the left set to two tables which are not in the same column, they'll be mapped in the right set to two items which are in the same column. So Alice, basically, the items which were lucky enough to be put in the same column in the first set will be, will, be, will be kept there. Those that were mapped to two different columns should put them in the right set, but then the hash function will put them in the same, same column. So at the end, Alice gets that all of her items are mapped to the same column, okay? Either in the left set or in the right set, okay? So what we got that both Bob, if you remember, put his, each of his items to one table in each column, and Alice put each of her items in the two tables in exactly one column. Overall, we see that there's intersection of exactly you know, one table where both Alice and Bob put the, the, uh, put the same. For each item in the intersection, there's exactly one table where both of them put it. In this case, it's this yellow one. So therefore, what we do here is each one of them is doing this uh, hashing, you know, at, at home by, you know, without talking with the other party. Then they have a simple uh, circuit which that takes the first item here, compares it with, with the first item here, the second item with the second item here. And since in this table both I parties placed X in this yellow table and they placed it to you know, age of X in that table, which is the same here and here, okay? There'll be one location in the circuit where both of them place X, so therefore the comparison will, will, will compare, will, will, will see the two uh, uh, occurrences of X, okay? So great, how, low, how big is this circuit gonna be? So it's A times N times cuckoo hashing always requires the circuit to be a bit larger than N, so it's usually 1.2 times N. So it's a constant size, circuit for doing that. And actually we're doing cuckoo hashing here, so some items might not be placed here, will be placed in the stash. So each item which is placed in the stash will have to compare to all items of the other party. But since we have a constant number of stashes and each stash has a constant number of items, we have to do a constant number of comparisons with, with N items. So it seems okay. So this is where constants start to play. So we have a you know, constant size of stash per table. And if we look at it, all items in the main tables, okay, we have eight tables, each one of them requires n comparisons. So we take care of the, all the tables with just eight n comparisons. That's great. Now, each item in the stash must be compared to n items. So each party has uses four cuckoo hashing, so it has four stashes. Each stash might be of size two or three or whatever, so, or say of size S, so we have four times S times N comparisons for the items in the stash for each party. So we, for these items in the stash, we, we pay more than for the, main, for the main tables, okay? We can improve that a little bit, but the stash here are actually quite annoying, okay? They're, they're very annoying because for these you know, few items that are mapped to the stash, you pay more than for the rest of the uh, items. But this is a asymptotically you know, linear construction, okay? So that's, that's good, it was, wasn't known before. Okay. We have a better construction which is, for which we have an experimental result, and it goes like this. Uh, each part, okay, the parties, they consider four tables. Each table has a hash function uh, associated with it, and they agree on the tables and the hash functions. Okay, what we would like is to Alice to map each of her items either to the, so we only have four tables, not eight, okay? Each of, her Alice's, each of Alice's items should be mapped either to the two top tables or, the two, or the two, to the two lower tables. Each of Bob items should be placed either in the two left tables or in the two right tables, okay? So basically it's like cuckoo hashing, but it's different. Instead of putting it in one location, okay, or in the other, you have to put it in these two locations or in these two locations, in these two tables or these two tables, okay? 
it's not, it, it wasn't clear before we started if it works or not, okay? The actual protocol is a bit different, but let's, we'll, uh, we'll talk about this one. Okay, so it's like a Chrome system, and if they manage to do it, then, you know, Alice, if Alice owns X, she either puts X in both these tables or in both these tables, and Bob will put X either here or here. So there's exactly one table in which both of them intersect. So therefore, if we build the circuit, okay, which basically takes, oh, this is where Alice puts her items, this is where Bob puts his item. The circuit takes each item in this table, compares it to each item in this table. If both of them has X, there's going to be exactly one location where both of them have put X, and therefore we see the intersection. Okay, so the circuit is very, very simple. And the question is, can this be done? Okay. And if we make the tables larger and larger, before each table was of size n, if we start making them larger and larger, this would be possible, but you know, how big should we make these, these tables? So the new result, okay, the new result is that if we make each table of size 2n, okay, then this is possible with high probability, okay? So going back, we have four tables. Each, before we had eight tables of size n. Now we have four tables of size 2n, each of them, okay? So the overall size is about the same. And the new proof, okay, shows that you can, this, this works with high probability. And it, you know, we have the total of eight n bins or buckets because each table has two n bins. And uh, we can do it with eight n comparisons. And there are a few variants. So this theorem was proved using a, a new technique. Probably won't have time to describe it, but it's a new proof technique that can also be applied to prove the original versions of uh, uh, cuckoo hashing, as well as more general constructions, which are like generalizations of, of cuckoo hashing. Can you, uh, just yeah. So you have a hash function yeah. that maps every entry, every entity x into a location in this table. So okay. So, so for each table, we have a different hash function, which takes a value and maps it to a location. So if I'm looking for a specific value x, I know there's only one location in the table in which x can appear. So after you fill in the tables, you will have only zero and one entries, saying there is an entry here or not? Uh, no. So if I have x, I'm going to put it in, 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 in this entry, say. The actual, entry. The, the actual x, say x is like 32 bits long or whatever. And then the circuit will take you know, the x that I put here and the x that you put here. You put here in your copy of the table and compare both of them. Okay. So actually we can do a little better. So, okay. Here we have a table of size, the, the theorem was proved for a table of size 2n. Each table of the size 2n. Okay, and each entry can hold one item. We can actually do better instead of looking at a table of size 2n, we look at a table of size n, but each bin in the table will be able to store two items. So the total size will be the same. Instead of a table with two n entries of size one, we'll have n entries of size two. Okay, it's known, so the total size will still be 8n. It's known in regular cuckoo hashing that if you do this, instead of having you know, a certain number of uh, entries of size one, have half the number of entries of size two, you'll get better utilization, better memory utilization. In, and we, in cuckoo hashing is known both theoretically and experimentally. Here we suspected that the same thing uh, happens. We don't know to prove that this is indeed the case, that indeed if, if we you know, make the tables half as big but make each bin uh, being able to occupy two items, then we have better hashing. Better hashing means that we'll have to use the stash less, and we really don't want to use the stash because each item in the stash we have to pay for it. You know, comparing it with all items. This was the you know the conjecture. We don't know how to prove it, but then we run experiments to verify it. So the experiments we verified were we verified were quite extensive. So we ran two to the 30 experiments of hashing n items to four tables, which table had about n entries of size two. Now, okay, this two to the 40 is a lot, okay? It's like, you know, 
a thousand, no, a million times, million times, you know, hashing n items to a table, uh, we end up you know, spending more than two million core hours, okay? That's, it's, it's even a lot of money. If, if you, have to, if you buy it, have to buy it at Amazon, that's a, a lot. If you don't have a local cluster to work on, okay? What we did, we used, uh, we checked it for to the eight, to the 10, to the 12, although we're interested in larger ends. And we saw that the number, the probability of having to use the stash decreases, uh, you know, cubically with n. So it's like n to the minus three, quite accurately. And for n, which is two to the 12, we only had to use the Actually in experiment you know, two to the 93.15, we were almost sure that we won't have to use the stash. And then, you know, towards the end, we, we had to use it. Uh, but what we can claim is that, okay, the probability of having to use the stash decreases as n to the minus three. So therefore, for n, which is greater than two to the 12, the failure probability is smaller than uh, two to the minus 40. We don't know how to prove this theoretically. Even if there will be a proof, okay, the proof won't have the constants in it. We'll be able to show that this holds for large enough ends, but we won't be able to show the proof. Uh, but this, I think that these experiments are quite, quite convincing. Now there's another related work which we heard about uh, recently. Uh, this is also work of uh, Rasmus Pau and a student. On they were trying to do intersection with GPUs and they used a similar model, okay? Uh, they had three tables and they used a variant of cuckoo hashing where each item had to be put in two out of the three tables. Okay, so we had four tables, you had to put it either in these two or in that two. They had you have to put it in two out of the three. And then if you put an item in two out of three tables, and if Alice puts in two out of three, Bob's puts in two out of three, then they are guaranteed to have an intersection. The problem, they didn't care about privacy. They cared about doing it on the GPU. Uh, with many processors. The, prob the problem is that they might be intersecting in, in two tables, not just in one. But with a sing another bit for signaling, you can make sure that you only count this once, not more than that. Uh, the total number of buckets is only 8n, uh, 6n, not 8n like us. They didn't have an analysis. There's a new work of Epstein, Goodrich, Mitzenmacher, and Torres, which analyzes the, the stashes of this size, but experimentally it seemed to behave worse than ours for the size of the stash, which really matters, and they, they didn't care about constants here. Okay, so asymptotically, 6n and not 8n, uh, experimentally the stash seems to make, uh, to cause problems here. Okay, so we needed to set the parameters, we run experiments for the, uh, you know, what F should be, what the size of the stash should be. We use something called permutation-based hashing so we can store less items in each bin. And we used four tables of size N where each entry can store two items. And somehow in the version that I described here, Bob needs to use a, a stash. Alice doesn't, Bob needs to use one. I won't say why. Okay, so here are the results. So this is a circuit for comparing a million items of size 32 bits long. This is the sorting network approach I, dis I described. This is the one with, where one part is doing cuckoo, the other one is doing simple hashing. And this is our best version. It's better to look at the last column. The last column has normalized numbers. Basically, this was the best that was known before our construction, so I put it to value one. It was twice as small as the sorting network. The circuit size was twice as small. And we are able to improve this you know, by a factor of three or more. So our circuit is much smaller. If you look at the evaluation time, okay, I'll highlight different properties of this table, but let's look what's there. This is specific protocol for computing the size of the intersection. These are circuits that compute the size of the intersection. This was the best one that was known before our work, and these are our constructions. This is, okay, on the LAN, 
for 64,000 a million items on wide area network, 64,000 items and a million items. So let's see. So this was based on elliptic curve crypto. This was based on secure computation. This is one gigabit per second. The other is uh, 100 uh, megabit per second and the round trip cost of 100 millisecond. So what do we get here? One thing we see for the, the approach that doesn't use a circuit. This is just using a specific protocol that can only compute the size of the intersection, not other variants. These are more, like, more versatile. This one is, it uses elliptic curve crypto. It's very good in terms of communication, but it's doing a lot of computation. So you see that the runtime is independent of the network. If you use, do it for two to the 16 items on a LAN or wide air network, it's about the same time. Same for larger uh, sets. So communication here is very small. It doesn't matter. Just com the com computation here where you invest. Uh, here you see that when the network increases by a factor of 10, uh, well, the network slows down by a factor of 10, as you can see from here to here. The runtime from here to here decreases by a factor of slightly more than 10. So here communication is the bottleneck. Not Uh, this is, okay, uh, the best protocol we have. Now, if we look at the LAN, our protocol performs much better. It's like two times five faster than the previous circuit-based protocol. And here, eight times faster than uh, the uh, specific protocol. The previous circuit-based protocol couldn't run on, on, on a LAN, on, on this size of inputs. The implementation wasn't good enough for that. If you look on a wide area network, then actually the size of the circuit matters less. I mean, the specific protocols that uses elliptic curve crypto for computing the intersection in our protocol perform about the same. Here they're better, here we're better. Uh, but they can only be used to compute the size. We can use our circuit to compute any, any function that you, that you want. So, the contribution of the new protocol is it's asymptot asymptotically better. We can do a circuit with only a linear uh, size and linear overhead so compared to n log n over log log n before. It runs faster, uh, and we have new analysis, new analysis techniques for cuckoo hashing that might be uh, used elsewhere, and it simplifies the use of, of PSI. And I'll uh, conclude with further research directions. Okay. Uh, the main annoying thing is the stash. Like you have a few items mapped to the stash. You cannot ignore them because if you ignore them, then you leak some privacy. I mean, you leak some information. And uh, still, you have to pay a lot for them. So you would like to I mean, ideally not use it at all and at least you know, minimize the effect of the stash. Uh, another interesting thing is to do protocols for party case where you have more than two parties, okay, and you want to con construct a circuit where you, know, you have three or four or five parties and somehow they all map the same item to the same bin, and, and we uh, started working on, the, on that. And also look at alternative approaches uh, without multi-table cooking for doing a circuit-based PSI. And with this I conclude, I can also talk about the proof for the cuckoo hashing you could go hashing, but it's, it's, it's quite technical. So, thanks. Okay. Okay, so the question, which is actually a slide which I removed from the, uh, from the talk, was that uh, a, uh, if we reveal in which bin uh, a match was done, okay, this leaks some information about the other party's input. So one way to solve that, like what like it was done for... Uh, uh, the assorting network is to get the results and then shuffle them. Now, this final shuffling costs n log n. So, with, with sorting networks, they paid n log n for merging, a linear O n for comparing, and n log n for shuffling. We do the first two steps with a linear overhead, and if we have to do shuffling at the end, we have to pay n log n. Now, but shuffling is important if you want to reveal the intersection itself, and to compute the intersection itself, uh, you, uh, you have better protocols than using a circuit. 
a circuit, a circuit is useful for computing a function of the intersection, and like the size of the intersection or the size with some noise or you uh, 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 add revenues or whatever. And basically, if what you compute is a symmetric function of the intersection, you find. So what's a symmetric function? A symmetric function is one that has the same output regardless of the order of the inputs. So if you compute the number of items in the intersection, it's basically a symmetric function. You don't care whether intersection, in which bins the intersections happen, you just add them. Or if you add revenues or whatever. So basically, if you are computing a symmetric function of the intersection, and in all applications I can think of are uh, symmetric functions of the intersection, then the circuit that computes the final output after you had the intersection doesn't have to shuffle the results because the final output, the symmetric function output doesn't reveal information about the, in, the, the order of the inputs, okay? So in these cases, you don't need to do this uh, final shuffling, so we don't have to add the shuffling, which costs n log n, which kind of uh, you know, uh, kills everything, because we work hard to have linear overhead up to there, and then doing the shuffling is, is, is too much. Okay. So is that a problem even when you don't need to use the stash? The, the shuffle? No, the, the problem of revealing information depending on... So for what I know about Google hashing, you place something in the corresponding position, and if some other object has to be placed there, you evict the previous one and yeah. send it to the other people, yeah. right? So are, I'll, I'll, I'll say the question because I'm not sure if, if, if what you're saying is recorded or not. So the question was, as far as I could tell, is uh, suppose we're doing cuckoo hashing and we don't have to use the stash. Uh, if I learn that Alice put, she could put X in one of two locations. If I learn that she chose to put X in this location, uh, would that leak information? And the answer is that uh, it does leak information. I mean, the, the, uh, the worst case is where I know a priori that Alice has one of two sets of inputs. Either she has this set or that set. And both sets have the same intersection with my set, but I want to know which one of them she has, okay? Like, you know, I only care about, you know, specific person if he's in her uh, set, and uh, it's, he's not in the intersection, okay? So in that case, it might happen that having this person in the set or not will affect how other items are placed in bins. It's very like, it's actually, it's, it's, you know, if there is a collision between that, that item and other items, we'll, we'll see that. And actually, it's not known as far as I can, as, as far as I know, but I'm, I'm pretty sure how to do cuckoo hashing where the uh, location, the, the choice of the between the two locations where each item can be placed is random and doesn't depend on the other items. So and this would be actually very nice, yeah. but we don't know how to do it, so we have to hide the order where 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 we where the in which beans matchings were found. Yeah. Do you happen to have uh, like bandwidth? Yeah, I think we should. I mean, we, I think we have it in the in the paper. We have it. So it's basically the size of the ta of the size of the circuit times, you know, the, the cost per gate, and we use the GMW protocol. But we, we we have it for sure in the paper, so it would be easy to find the uh, communication overhead. Okay. Thank you. Ah. Oh, okay. So at the beginning, you, you had a line saying uh, that uh, PSI is equivalent to, to OT. So does that mean that uh, so from OT you can build all MPC, right? Yeah. So do you think that from PSI you can build all, all MPC as well? Okay, so the question was whether uh, I said that PSI is equivalent to OT. It's equivalent in a very, uh, you know, fundamental but weak uh, se uh, uh, meaning, meaning that if you can compute set intersection, we can do oblivious transfer. Okay, how can we do that? So, um, okay, you have two values. I need to learn one of them. You have to have a value, okay? I think you can get it. So if your two values are bits, we can do bit oblivious transfer using PSI. And then from bit oblivious transfer, we can do string oblivious transfer. From that, we can do all crypto. So we cannot hope to do PSI more efficiently than OT, but I don't think that PSI is the most efficient way of implementing OT. Yeah, it was just a curiosity. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thank